Welcome to a study of the readings assigned for this upcoming Sunday, which are from the book of Exodus, the Gospel of Luke, and Paul's first letter to Timothy. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that as we come to study your word once again, that your word will work within our spirits, open our minds and our hearts to receive what you have to say to us today. We thank you, Lord, that this lesson is so important for us as we study the truth of your word and the need for the truth, the need to understand what you have done for us and that we need to turn to you in times of trouble, not to turn away from you. So we thank you, Lord, that as these lessons today teach us these things, that they would become an important part of our walk with you. So we receive the lessons in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. This upcoming Sunday is the 24th Sunday in the liturgical season of ordinary time. We will study the readings chronologically with the first reading from the Old Testament from the book of Exodus, then study the New Testament readings first from the Gospel of Luke, and then finish our study, the second reading from Paul's first letter to Timothy, and see how the readings all relate to one another. Putting our readings in a time relationship on our timeline, this coming Sunday's first reading from chapter 32 from the book of Exodus takes place around 1450 BC. The events from the gospel reading from Luke are in 30 AD, and the first letter to Timothy was written around 63 AD. Sunday's first reading from the book of Exodus is from chapter 32. The book, of course, is about God delivering the Jewish people out of Egypt after spending 400 years there, which started out just fine. The Jewish people were favored and treated well by Pharaoh. But over time, subsequent Pharaohs became threatened by the large increase in the number of Jewish people in Egypt, and they were made slaves. The first 31 chapters of the book of Exodus tells us how the Jewish people leave Egypt under the leadership of Moses and are on their way to the promised land. We pick up the story in chapter 31, where Moses has led the people to Mount Sinai. He has gone up the mountain and will be given the two tablets of stone which contain the Ten Commandments, the covenant that God makes with the Jewish people. Chapter 32 tells us what is going on with the people down at the base of the mountain while Moses is up there for 40 days. We'll start with verse 1. That leads us up to the reading at verse 7. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from the ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image out of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. So the people can't understand why Moses is delayed. So they take matters into their own hands, which leads them into sin. God had a wonderful purpose for the delay, but the people grew impatient. This, in fact, should be a good lesson for us when we don't see things happening in our favor as quickly as we would like, especially when we have prayed for something. This time should be used to persevere in your faith, not as a time to drift into sin or unbelief. Now notice that the lapse into sin did not start with Aaron. It started with popular opinion, the people gathering around Aaron and telling him they're unhappy with the situation and want to do something else. This is how popular opinion today can lead individuals astray by listening to what popular opinion says, not what God says. 
Not only is the secular world led and influenced by popular opinion, but so are Christians in the Christian community. Some people in the congregation may think certain parts of the Bible can be disregarded, which they can, they, which then can influence the entire congregation to turn from the word of God and begin to think like the secular world. Even Aaron here, Moses' right-hand man, is swayed by the crowd and gives in to sin rather than telling the people this is idolatry. In today's world, other gods, money, fame, power, are the idols that can lead people from the straight and narrow path that God, through his son Jesus Christ, teaches us to follow. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. It's interesting that here God says to Moses, your people, suggesting he's ready to disown them. By quoting what the people said when they made the idol shows that even though they ignored God, God did not ignore them. He knows what's going on down there. Not only did they turn from God, they had the audacity to say these the false gods are what brought them out of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? In other words, stiff-necked here is a metaphor used by, by farmers to an ox or horse that will not respond to the rope when it is tugged. So God shows here that he's, he's really hopping mad. We should be mad when we see sin and depravity in our presence. God says to Moses, leave me alone. I'm done with these people. God even gets to the point that he's ready to give up on these people and start all over again with Moses, just as he did with Noah. Verse 12. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains? and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Then the reading picks up at verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he had planned to bring on his people. Now, here is verse 12 that's left out of the reading this Sunday. Moses says the Egyptians will blame God for taking the Jewish people out of Egypt just so that he can kill them. But even more importantly, in this verse is Moses saying, turn from your wrath and change your mind. The words here, change your mind, is a single Hebrew word. Nahum, and in the King James Version, it is translated repent. That is what Moses is asking God to do, repent. It's the same concept we have when we are instructed to confess our sins and repent, meaning change your mind or turn around, do something different. When we sin, we are told to turn ourselves around and not do those things again. Here's the same concept of Moses asking God to do something different than what he wants to do. Now, if you remember, remember when we studied Genesis chapter 18, when Abraham had the Lord and two angels visit him, and Abraham pleaded with the Lord to spare Sodom if he found any righteous people in the city, there he gets God to change his mind, just like Moses is trying to get God to change his mind here. Then Moses reminds God about the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants, that they would inherit the land. And in verse 14, it says, the Lord changed his mind. 
This is the same Hebrew word Moses used in verse 12, Nahum. It says that God repented. Next, we'll study the gospel reading. This Sunday's gospel is designated as all of chapter 15 from the gospel of Luke. But only part of chapter 15 might be read depending on which service you attend Sunday. You may recall that this chapter was also the gospel reading six months ago on March 27th and the fourth Sunday of Lent. The lesson about the prodigal son is of such importance that it is the gospel reading twice during this year. Just as our first reading is about the need for the Jewish people to repent of their sin of idolatry, as we read in the first reading, so does the prodigal son need to repent of his sin and return to the love of his father. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to him, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. And upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having 10 coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be a rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus is responding to the scribes and Pharisees in parables. The first parable has three images that show how God relates to us. It says that Jesus communes with sinners. Aren't we glad that Jesus will speak to tax collectors and sinners and even eat with them? Just like today, whoever you have meals with, you are identified as one of them. That's the same thing Jesus is doing here. The second parable, speaking about a shepherd, it's a lowly position. When sheep get weary, they will stop walking. So a shepherd has to go and seek that particular sheep that gets tired and stops walking and retrieve them. We do the same thing. We get weary. We stop our walk with Jesus, and he has to come and carry us back home. Then the woman who loses a coin, it's thought that this might have been the headpiece of a chain of 10 coins that was a traditional uh, adornment that the women wore back then. So it has a greater value than its denominational value. It has an even greater intrinsic value. That's how God sees us. Then he said, a man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend his swine. And he longed to eat his fill of pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat, but here I am I, dying from hunger. I shall get up, go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat me, one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. 
His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fatted calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, look, all these years I've served you and not once did I disobey your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fatted calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Now we take a look at what this means. The definition here of particle is wastefully or recklessly extravagant. There are three types of characters in this parable. The father is portrayed as one who has the heart of God. The older brother represents the Pharisees and Sadducees that Jesus is speaking to. The younger brother represents the tax collectors and sinners that Jesus is associating with for the contempt of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Neither understands the heart of the father because both are rebellious. One is rebellious and sinful, but then repents and experiences the love of the father. The other is in the house of the father, but his heart is hardened, rebellious to his father's love for his younger brother. Neither wants to be like their father. Verse 12, the older son would be entitled to a double portion, being the oldest son. The younger gets his portion. We live in a world today of give it to me now. Give me what I deserve. There is nothing we can do to deserve what God gives us. We have studied this many times. If God gave us what we deserve, we would all be condemned. As Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from you. It is a gift from God. It is not from works so that no one may boast. And in verse 14, after he spends all his money, the prodigal son gets a job. He's so destitute, he is willing to tend pigs. Being Jewish, he's not supposed to consume pork, so his association with a food that God has banned from the Jewish menu is fitting. Not only that, he is willing to eat what pigs eat. In verse 17, coming to his senses is literally the Greek words coming to himself. He examined himself and determined that he needed to move himself to another place, not just physically, but mentally. In verse 18, the son rehearses what he will tell his father. He makes no excuses or blame. He admits his sin. He realizes even the lowest servant has it better than the freedom he has as a result of his living in sin. And in verse 19, the words, treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers, are just six Greek words that literally mean, make me as one of your servants, which is the way the older translations say it. He repents and says, make me as. We are to approach God in a way to ask him to make us as he wants us to be, not give us what we want. Earlier, the younger son wanted to get what his father had to give him, but he didn't want to hang around him, be like him, or follow his rules. Many people go to church every week, ask God for what he has for us, 
but do not want to follow his rules. Here, the younger son thinks about what he must do. And in verse 20, he acts, goes back to his father. Now, many people think about what they must do to get right with God, but do not act on it. The father always loved his son and runs to him. This is not the typical Middle Eastern paternal father who would wait until the son arrives then make him beg for permission to re-enter the house. God is not like that either. When his father meets him, he never gives the son a chance to list his transgressions. The son has already done that in his heart and then confessed to his father his unworthiness. Just as you confess your sins, ask for and receive forgiveness, God remembers your sin no more. Even though we don't deserve it, we are forgiven. Verses 22 and 23, the son is dressed in better clothes and he is fed. Verse 24 telling us that his son was dead in sin but repented, now he is alive. The same happens when we renew ourselves to God by being forgiven of our sins. The older son hears the commotion and wonders what it's all about. So that at verse 28, he becomes angry. Just as the scribes and Pharisees were when Jesus ate with sinners, the father begs the older son to join his brother and celebrate. Verse 29, we see that the son relates all the service he has provided his father and followed the rules, wants to know why he didn't get a party. The younger brother went from give me to forgive me and then make me what I should be, while the older brother said, you never gave me. Then verse 31 tells us that the word son here can be translated child as other translations do because he is acting like one. He was insulted that his father would welcome his brother back. His father says he can have a party anytime he wanted to, then says he should instead rejoice that his fallen brother has returned. Now the father is as brokenhearted over the oldest son as he was with the younger son. So is God. The scribes and Pharisees did not rejoice that sinners were accepted by Jesus. They expected the reward for following their rules and were insulted by the fact that God accepts sinners. They did not understand what we mentioned earlier from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is the gift of God. It's not from works, so that no one may boast. So what did the older brother do? It is left unsaid because it is up to the scribes and Pharisees to decide, just as it is up to us to decide how to respond to God's word. As mentioned earlier, the first reading and the gospel our direct teaching for us about reconciliation, returning back to the good graces of God and repenting when we have strayed. This concludes the gospel reading for this Sunday. Second reading is from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. Throughout September and October, the second reading will be from Paul's first and second letters to Timothy. So for the next two months, we'll be studying those two letters in their entirety. Paul spent two years in Ephesus during his third evangelistic journey, as depicted by the blue track on the map and time bar on the timeline. This letter was written after Paul was released from prison and apparently was in Macedonia when he wrote it around 63 AD. Timothy is in Ephesus, so these letters are sent to him while Timothy is there. Timothy is a leader in the church of Ephesus and is being instructed by Paul to preserve the pure teaching of Christian doctrine against false teaching. We will study starting at verse 1, which leads us to the Sunday's second reading of verses 12 through 17, which is at the end of the chapter. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle, of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my loyal child in the faith, grace, 
mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Here, Paul asserts his position as an apostle. By definition, an apostle was one of the members who Jesus chose specifically to follow him during his ministry and learn from him directly so that they could then carry out the command to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching what Jesus taught them. While Paul was not part of the original 12 apostles before Jesus ascended, after he was converted by Jesus personally, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, Paul did spend time alone in the desert, and it is implied throughout his letters that the Lord taught him directly. Later, the original apostles do assert Paul's apostleship, and Paul is considered the apostle to the Gentiles, as God had called him to be. As Paul alludes to here as well, by the command of God, he is given the apostleship. Paul typically refers to those who he brought to Christ as his children in faith, not literally his children by birth. Verse 3. I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine plan that is known by faith. But the aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Some people have deviated from these and turned to meaningless talk, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make assertions. So after a salutation to Pim Timothy, Paul instructs Timothy to stop those who are teaching the doctrines that are leading them astray from the main teachings that they should be holding to. They're involved in meaningless talk, as verse 6 says. They don't even know what they're talking about, as it says in verse 7. This is like a phrase that is used today when people get off on the, such discussions as being involved in determining how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Most likely, the myths and endless genealogies that he mentions here in verse 4 are beliefs from Jewish doctrine and tradition that divert the congregation from the foundational teaching that must be understood and not confused with other extraneous ideas. They were teaching things to be speculated upon that involved reason and rationality and were missing the direct message of the gospel to live in love and the love of Christ, not of vain speculation and rationality. They were saying it's not rational. And if it's not rational, it must be rejected. So much of what is in God's word is not rational. If we use that as a measure against God's worth, so much would be rejected. Because when God says to live by faith, living by faith, seeing in your spirit as opposed to seeing it physically, that is not a rational way of thinking in today's scientific world. Now, where it says here about meaningless genealogies, I have to mention that uh, we know that there are two genealogies recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. This is only to prove to the Jewish people and subsequently Gentile believers that Jesus did fulfill the prophecies which specifically listed descendants of Abraham that would be ancestors of the Messiah. But that is their purpose alone and not to be a debated topic. So these verses present the first of six reasons why Timothy should stay in Ephesus and complete the ministry God gave him to do. Because they need the truth. So how do they get the truth? How do they get it back then? It's important to note that at that time, Christians did not have the Bible, which represents God's word, and which we have printed in beautifully bound copies today. Their teaching about Jesus and what Jesus taught was done through the actual evangelization and teaching of the apostles that Jesus sent out and then designated and appointed people like Timothy who would be left to lead the congregations that they were entrusted with. 
The letters, which are now part of our compiled Bible, were the only written instruction available to the first century Christians. And that's the reason why the letters were copied and distributed among the congregations as a means of getting written Christian teaching. Our timeline will show how the Bible came to be. The blue text at the bottom shows the timeline time frames for the sections of the Bible. The Jewish converts, of course, had the Old Testament which recorded the history of the Jewish people and foretold of the Messiah with written manuscripts that were written between 1400 and 400 BC. The Deuterocanonical books were written between 200 BC and 100 AD. Paul's first letter to Timothy was written here around 63 AD. And the New Testament books were written between 50 and 95 AD, which are mostly letters. The first widespread edition of the entire Bible was assembled by St. Jerome around 400 AD. It's called the Vulgate. It was written in Latin, that being the common language of the Roman Empire. It contained the 66 books in all Christian Bibles. The Latin manuscript was, of course, hand copied so any copies of the entire set of scriptures were rare. The first English translation was not produced until 1388, and it was not until 1455 that Gutenberg used the printing press to produce the first printed Bible, and it was printed in Latin. It did not contain the deuterocanonical books, the seven books included in today's Catholic editions. We take for granted the convenience and access that we have to God's word. Back in Paul's time, it was all by oral teaching and copied and shared written letters. Back to the letter, verse 8. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it legitimately. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. So this tells us that the law of Moses is not for the righteous who walk by faith. Galatians 3.11 says, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the one who is righteous will live by faith. What the law does is show the lawless and disobedient their sin. So what is sin in God's eyes? Paul lists some of what sin constitutes. Fornication, which is engaging in sex outside of marriage. Sodomy, which is sex with someone of the same gender. Slave traders, which gives us an entirely different understanding of how slavery was viewed at the time. As we said earlier, slaves were those who owed a debt and were then slaves to those to whom the debt was owed. To buy and sell or trade slaves is seen as sinful. If slave owners in America who professed to be Christian had understood this important distinction, slavery could have been much different in America. Then Paul makes sure he adds in verses 10 to 11, sin is anything contrary to the sound teaching of the gospel. While the law cannot bring righteousness, the glorious gospel can. This then shows us the second reading of why Timothy should stay in Ephesus and complete the ministry God gave to him. Because Timothy ministers in a hard place. And verse 12 is where the reading for the Sunday starts. I'm grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul is observing that God gave him the strength and ability to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. It was nothing he was able to do on his own. 
He also observes that God judged him faithful to do what he was given to do, even though he was a persecutor of Christians before Jesus got a hold of him on the road to Damascus. It was God's mercy that forgave him and instilled in him the faith and love through Christ Jesus that he now re represents to others. We too must realize that God gives you the strength and ability that you need to fulfill your mission in the body of Christ, not anything that you can do by yourself. Verse 15, the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I receive mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So important in verse 15 is the saying that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, that Paul uses the phrase five times in his two letters to Timothy, and also later in his letter to Titus. Paul is not diminishing his sinful past life. He's even considering himself one of the worst sinners that there could be. It was that sinful life and the mercy God showed to Paul that he was able to use as an example to show others that no matter how sinful their life is, God will be patient and grant mercy to the worst sinners, just as Paul was granted mercy and forgiven and able to receive eternal life. So this brings us to the third of at least six reasons that why Timothy should stay in Ephesus and complete the ministry God gave him to do, because God uses unworthy people. It also includes the fourth reason, because Timothy serves a great God. Then the end verses are not in the reading this Sunday. At verse 18, I'm giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them, you may fight the good faith, having faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have turned over to Satan, so that they may learn not to blaspheme. The prophecies made earlier about you that Paul references here may have been a previous instance where someone may have received and shared with Timothy prophetic words by the Holy Spirit about his ministry that were now being carried out. Paul mentions this working of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 14.3 that those who prophesy speak to other people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. As I have mentioned in the past, prophecy does not always tell of the future, but can be a message that is uplifting and encouraging, as the prophets in the Old Testament did. Timothy is to fight the good fight with faith and a good conscience. By faltering in their faith and rejecting conscience, not being conscientious, the ministry given one can fail. Among them, he mentions here, Hymenaeus and Alexander. So as he mentions here, Satan is going to have his way with them. But by mentioning them specifically, they hopefully will learn not to blaspheme. So this shows us reasons five and six of why Timothy should stay in Ephesus and complete the ministry God gave him to do. Five, because Timothy is in a battle and cannot surrender. And number six, because not everyone else stays with the mission that God gave them to do. Now, the value to all of this is this. We can take these six reasons why Timothy should stay in Ephesus and turn them around as reasons for ourselves to stay with the ministry that God has given us to do. At least six reasons why we should stay where God has us and complete the ministry God gave us to do. Number one, because those we minister to 
need the truth. Two, because we minister in a hard place. Three, because God uses unworthy people like us. Four, because we serve a great God. Five, because we are in a battle and cannot surrender. And six, because not everyone else stays with the mission that God gave them to do. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word has given us so much to absorb today. We thank you, Lord, that your word to the Jewish people with Moses and then to the prodigal son as Jesus taught that we need to stay faithful to what God has for us, that we need to not lose sight of his word, that when things fall into despair, that we need to just turn that despair around into faith. We need to stand in faith against what Satan is trying to put into our minds and that we can stand in faith knowing that God will have a successful result for us in what we prayed for and what we believe. We also thank you, Lord, that you have given us lessons to learn regarding what we must do as we are given a mission in our lives that you give each one of us a path to follow and that we need to stay faithful to that. We need, and that is through you, we will see success, that we can't rely on ourselves and that we know that by trusting in you, that the mission you have given us to do, the path you have given us to follow will be fulfilled and will be successful in every way. So we've received this lesson today in Thanksgiving and we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen.